to a new video from York, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth, in collaboration with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. We are gathered here together via the technical quote-unquote wonder, uh, the equipment of Skype via computers that we can talk together even though we are thousands of miles apart. And uh, we are gathered here together again to prove to you that Jesus Christ was the perfect and complete fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. And we prove that by the New Testament, by taking the New Testament as a testimony. Um, a few days ago, I received a new book on this subject, and Tom made a very good point when I read here and there a little bit from that book, and he said, you, you don't, we don't even need books like these, because we have the whole New Testament as a witness to Jesus Christ being the 70th week of Daniel. And that's the reason for us to come together every Tuesday evening to talk about that. And not only to talk about that, but to prove to you by reading the New Testament, or many passages of the New Testament, that show that Jesus Christ was and is the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. I hope, Tom, I spoke in your spirit when I said these things that you were telling me, and I think you were absolutely correct, and we are sometimes looking too far for proof that is so close to us that we sometimes don't see it, maybe because it is too close, or we don't want to see it because we think, think ha things have to be complicated where things actually are easy, right? Yes, while well, we've been indoctrinated for so long, uh, virtually all of our lives, uh, that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future and won't, won't be even uh, begun until s just about seven years or three and a half years, depending on whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, uh, won't begin until just seven years before Christ literally returns. And uh, But the truth is, uh, that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled 2,000 years ago by Jesus himself. Daniel prophesied a seven-year period of time when Messiah would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And here we've been taught all, the, all of our lives that this, is, this 70 week of Daniel is, is, is for the end times, just before Christ returns, and that 
uh, that it won't be Jesus who confirms a covenant with many for one week, but the Antichrist will confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, not that Jesus will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life and, and the veil of the temple rent in twain from top to bottom, but that some future Antichrist is going to uh, cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease in a rebuilt uh, Jewish temple in a brand spanking new uh, 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 Israeli state, and it just, uh, it's, it's uh, well, the point I originally started to make was that we've been indoctrinated with futurism for so long, it's hard for us to even read the New Testament and see for ourselves that Daniel's prophecy, the 70th week of Daniel, is recorded as having been fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. The New Testament is the record of Christ's ministry in the world. It's a seven-year period of time, beginning with his baptism, three and a half years later, his crucifixion, Three and a half years later, the going forth of the, of, the, of the gospel to the Gentiles, the end of the 490th year, uh, uh, and Daniel's prophecy for the Jews, that is Daniel's people, and Jerusalem is over. And they finally rejected Jesus, and the gospel went to the Gentiles. It's the difference between uh, uh, the end of that 490th year is the end of Daniel's prophecy and uh, the final rejection of Messiah by the Jewish nation. And uh, the going forth, now it's our responsibility to, to spread the gospel of Messiah. We received him. He's our Messiah. We understood what he did when he came for, and, and performed the 70 week, the 70th week prophecy of, of Daniel. And uh, since the Jews rejected him, uh, now it becomes our responsibility to evangelize the world, including the Jews who rejected him 2,000 years ago. And uh, the very, fr the, pr the very, pr we've made this point before. It's a little bit redundant for some of the listeners, but uh, uh, the very proof that the 70th week of Daniel o is over is evidenced by the fact that the Jews don't evangelize the world. We do, the Gentiles. And uh, Paul's commandment to the Gentiles was to provoke the Jews to jealousy for their own Jewish Messiah, who they rejected 2,000 years ago at the end of the, two, of the 70th and final week of Daniel. And uh, listen, uh, I'm sure, and most of the listeners that, that have chose to, have chosen to make comments uh, in these videos have already concluded, uh, they see the point that uh, historicists, that is the idea that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus 2,000 years ago, that is the historicist uh, fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week is far, far easier to believe and understand than, it, than the so-called phony futurist explanation for the 70th week of Daniel. And but but I'm not I'm not satisfied with that. I, I want I want the listeners to see what the world wants God's people to to uh, what is the purpose of this 70th week? Is it just to deceive or does it have a purpose? And I believe it has a purpose. It has a purpose to make God's people receive a false messiah. And, uh, of course, history will prove this until it's fulfilled. It's just an assertion, a prediction. It, it's a, it can't be a, uh, a certainty. We can't be dogmatic about it. But I don't, believe, I don't believe the futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy has any other purpose but then to get God's people uh, uh, to, to believe, first of all, in a false antichrist, one who signs a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews and then breaks it after three and a half years, and then after that, a false messiah. Okay? That's the whole purpose of this futurist thing. 
Yeah, because uh-huh. Satan wants to ha- deceive as many souls and yeah. to get as many souls as possible because every soul won for Satan is a soul lost for God. That's right. And um, some people are so easy to deceive and the reason that they are easy to deceive is that they don't have faith that is built on a foundation. Yeah. And the only foundation that you can build your faith on is the word of God, is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the truth, the way and the life. And if you don't have the truth that is in Jesus Christ, that is Jesus Christ himself, he is the truth. If you don't have him, you are easily deceived. Yeah. And that goes for all ages, Tom. I think that is a very important point to make. We are not only mm-hmm. talking about people who are living in these days or a century or two, three ago, but we speak of all the people. We speak of all the people after Adam and Eve, because mm-hmm. that's when the temptation came. Cain was mm-hmm. the first who fell for Satan's lies, right? Yeah. After Eve, of yeah. course. Well, Adam. Adam and Eve first did. Yeah, they after Adam, after Adam and Eve. Yeah, but you know, I, I, I like to believe, Tom, that they have been restored in their faith by Jesus Christ. Well, certainly, I, I believe too. I mean, after all, it was Jesus who clothed them with coats of skins. Exactly. In other words, he made sacrifice for them. He killed an animal. There was an innocent animal who lost its life. Uh, and Christ literally clothed Adam and Eve with the skins of that animal that he sacrificed uh, uh, as a typification of, of Christ's eventual sacrifice. I believe Adam and Eve were saved exactly, precisely the same way that you and I are. Right, but Cain was not. That's at least no, my understanding Cain, of the Bible. So that's why Cain I say... Did, Cain didn't receive the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He didn't understand the, the, the godly concept of, of uh, without, the, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And Cain offered, uh, instead of a lamb, instead of a blood sacrifice, understanding that Jesus is the lamb of God, that would be slain for us all, instead of offering a lamb like Abel did, and as like, like Jesus slew for Adam and Eve, uh, he, 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 he sacrificed the works of his hands, a, a grain offering. The fruits of his own work, yeah. A bloodless sacrifice, a work, uh, a sacrifice made of his own hands. Yeah, I like it to and, call, to, sorry, I like to call it the fruits of his own hands because uh, Jesus says, by the fruits you will know them. And yeah. those are the fruits by which we know the people, whether they are in Christ or not, right? Yeah. Because whether they rely on their own works, their own fruits, or they rely on the perfect sacrifice that Jesus Christ did once and for all. Now, the Jews made sacrifice according to the law of Moses. They, they made a blood sacrifice. And they did that until Christ literally gave up his own life in the midst of the 70th week of Daniel. He became the sacrifice. And as acknowledged by God as the perfect and complete sacrifice for sin, God ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom and put an end. By doing that, he put an end to animal sacrifices. Jesus was the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Every sacrifice, every blood sacrifice that had been made in the past, all the way back to Adam and Eve, were simply typifications of what Jesus would eventually do in the midst of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. And when Jesus made that final sacrifice of his own self, and his blood was shed for the remission of sins, to put an end of sin to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to anoint the most holy, that was it. He said, it is finished. Well, what what do you mean? Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled completely. It's finished. The, the, The divine plan for salvation of mankind was finished. All right? Now, if we understand that, that it's finished... What would we be doing if we were to continue to make sacrifice? We would deny Jesus was the Christ. That's right. It's a simple, 
outward act of denial that Jesus was the Messiah prophesied by Daniel. And that's why God had the temple destroyed, not one stone left upon another, to make absolutely sure the whole world knows no more sacrifices. No more sacrifices. And he, Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world, caused all sacrifices and oblations to cease, exactly like Daniel's prophecy says. And uh, so anybody who says this 70th week of Daniel is future doesn't have a clue. Absolutely does not have a clue. And they're going to be deceived. For anybody to believe such a, a childish and ridiculous uh, interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, in spite of the fact that we've got the, the New Testament record of its perfect and complete fulfillment by Jesus Christ, deserves to be deceived. And now look, before anybody, you know, you know just rails and uh, because I've just humiliated them or, or offended them, I'm telling you first and foremost, for 50 years of my life, I held that belief that the 70th week of Daniel was future. I was never taught anything otherwise. But let me say again, despite of offending myself, anyone who believes the futurist lie about Daniel's 70th week deserves to be deceived. You have denied that Jesus was the Messiah. When you say the 70th week of Daniel is future, you're literally saying Messiah has not come in the flesh. Messiah has not come in the flesh. Jesus was not the Messiah. Now, what is that but the spirit of Antichrist? The Bible plainly says, he that saith that, G that Messiah has not come in the flesh, he, he is of the spirit of Antichrist. That's what the Bible says. It's a horror, isn't it? For 50 years of my life, when I said the 70th week of Daniel was future, which is what I was always taught in the churches, and it didn't matter what church I went to, they all taught the same thing about Daniel's 70th week, that it's future. I was literally being taught that Jesus was not the Messiah. And that's what all the churches teach. And I don't see any churches repenting of that futurist lie. Well, they, they, they spend all their time singing praises and hymns to Jesus. They got the most beautiful music. They got the most beautiful sermons. They got the most beautiful churches, great big, huge mega churches. They fly jet airplanes. They got the fanciest cars. They're everywhere, morning, noon, and night on every channel. They, they, they preach to presidents. They preach to Congress. They preach to the world. And yet, out of the other side of their mouth, they deny that Jesus ever came. They, they deny that Messiah ever came. And they're not going to repent. They're not going to repent. Because they'd have to admit they were wrong. They would have to admit they were deceived. They would have to admit that their whole Christian life, the Holy Spirit failed to realize to them that they were literally denying that Christ had come in the flesh. So they have to deny that they didn't have and possess the Holy Spirit, see? And especially those who of their own mouth say that they possess the Holy Spirit, they're anointed with the Holy Spirit, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they can even speak a heavenly angelic language that even they can't understand. They think themselves so holy, but yet that Holy Spirit that they say that they possess, that indwells them, that takes control of their tongue and makes them speak heavenly languages, the language, the language of of angels, they say. None of them were ever told by this angelic voice, this angelic tongue, that futurism is of the spirit of Antichrist. 
it denies the, 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 that Christ came in the flesh. Horror of horrors. And so much so, this is so contrary to what they believed and what they've taught, they are steadfast in their error, and they're going to believe that error one way or another, no matter how much sense I or anybody else makes, no matter how many times we prove it from the literal black and white text of the New Testament, they're going to hold on to their lie. They can't admit they were wrong. But we're going to continue to show them the proof texts, multitudes of proof texts right in the Bible that there's not one iota of Daniel's prophecy that Jesus and the apostles, the spirit-filled apostles, did not fulfill of Daniel's 70th week. Yeah, Tom, we started in this uh, study paper that we do with uh, Daniel chapter 9, uh, verse 24, and we have come so far that today we will start in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, which is the concluding verse of the chapter, and which leads us into much more truth reading the New Testament along with it. And from here we will go into a very big study of the understanding that Jesus Christ, without any doubt, was and still is the complete and perfect fulfillment of this prophecy spoken by um, the archangel Gabriel to the prophet Daniel in right. Babylonian captivity. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it is worth also that we mention that it is the archangel Gabriel who gave this uh, prophecy to Daniel. It is not Daniel who spoke of himself like he did in other chapters, Right. Uh, like chapter 2, when he explained the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had because he was given that understanding of the dream and what the, uh, what, the, what the dream meant in a dream. And then he told it himself. But here Daniel is told something from godly authority because that's what an archangel is. That's what, uh, that's what um, Gabriel was. He had the authority straight from heaven to give this prophecy to a chosen man on the earth who was in the captivity of Babylon. And I think that is a very valid point to understand because Daniel chapter 9, this prophecy, doesn't deal with what man says, doesn't deal with what prophets say, like you have to have the prophet Isaiah and Nehemiah and Jeremiah and all these guys, and I don't take anything away of what they say. They were also godly inspired, but it was their text. They said what the Holy Spirit gave them to say, but here it is the angel himself who tells this to Daniel. I think mm -hmm. this is even uh, from a higher authority, if <laughs> if you can say that. So I don't know if you agree with that, but I think that's a very important point to make for once. What do you think? Well, it, it's, it's hard to say that uh, the Holy Spirit ranks second to an angel, but nonetheless, uh, as an archangel, but nonetheless... Uh, uh, this is the case of an archangel literally commanded by the Lord to go and to instruct Daniel and to educate Daniel about what's going to happen in the future. And, and, and more than that, the precise timing of Christ's first coming. And literally, as much as placing a calendar date that Christ would come. Exactly... <clears throat> 483 years from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. You could you could just mark it down, 483 years, or, or 69 weeks of years. 483 years. That's what you take from Daniel's prophecy. Angel Gabriel, Archangel Gabriel told Daniel, from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince, is seven weeks and 62 weeks, which means 69 weeks. 69 times seven is 483 years. And that means uh, since the, the prophecy was 70 weeks or 490 years, there was only seven years remaining. And that was literally Christ's ministry in, in, in the, in, as recorded in the New Testament. 
And and so so and, and we're we're told all the time, don't be a date setter. Whatever you do, do not set a date for the second coming of Christ. Because Christ doesn't know, the angels of heaven don't know, no man knows, only the Father in heaven knows when Jesus is going to return the second time. The return for, you know, for, for his people. We knew precisely when he would come the first time. The angel Gabriel, the throne of glory through the angel Gabriel made sure that Daniel and Daniel's people that is, the Jews knew precisely 483 years before the fact when Messiah the Prince would come, the one who would fulfill the 70th week, the last seven years of the prophecy. So look, look. I mean, I don't know how else to say it, but that the whole nation of Israel it, by Daniel's prophecy alone, the whole nation of Israel should have been down at the river waiting for Jesus to be anointed by John and hail him as Messiah right then and there. But they didn't understand Daniel's prophecy. They were forbidden by the rabbis to read and understand Daniel's prophecy and ascertain the timing of the coming of Messiah. They were forbidden to know by their religious leaders, their rabbis, okay? The great authority of the, of the temple was the rabbis, the priests, the Levites, the, uh, the uh, scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They were all forbidden to read and understand Daniel's prophecy. You've got to ask yourself, why in the world were the Jewish people forbidden to read the book of Daniel to ascertain the timing of the coming of Messiah. The same reason why then, the Catholic Church invented its futurism, Tom. That's exactly right. To confuse us about Daniel's 70th week, because it's such an important prophecy. You, it's important for the Jews to know Daniel's prophecy so that they would be waiting for their Messiah when he came. There would be absolutely no way to miss him. No way to confuse his identity. No one could deceive them. And then in our generation, it's absolutely necessary for us to know Daniel's prophecy so nobody can foist upon us a phony future fulfillment of that prophecy. It happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus fulfilled it perfectly and completely. That's what makes him our Messiah. Okay? Not only ours, but the Jews' Messiah. And all the world. Okay? So who has confused us today? The same religious leaders that confused the Jews about Daniel's prophecy 2,000 years ago. Okay? Look, the Bible plainly tells us Satan is transformed into an angel of light. He looks like an angel of light. He's transformed. He can disguise himself as an angel of light. You know what else it says? And therefore his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. Who are his ministers? Well, I'll tell you who I think they are. They're the ones who say that Daniel's 70th week is future. Okay? Those who say they are possessed of the Holy Spirit, who are qualified to preach and to teach and to lead the sheep, they're telling us that the 70th week of Daniel is future. They are literally telling us that Jesus was not the Messiah. Now, I don't, if somebody can come to a different conclusion than that, I'd sure like to know about it. You know, I'd hate to think that I'm, that I'm, that I'm castigating a whole world of Protestant and evangelical pastors, many of whom I used to love and adore. But then again, I used to love and adore Billy Graham, and he turned out to be the greatest betrayer of Christ I've ever heard of. So I have little trust in man, little hope in man. And therefore, I'm not afraid to tell the truth about man. Any man who tells you the 70th week of Daniel is future is a diabolical liar. 
he wants to he wants to confuse you just like the Jewish rabbis wanted to confuse all of Israel before Jesus was baptized in river in the river Jordan when all of Israel should have been down at the river waiting for him they knew precisely when he was coming they even had a 30 year in advance warning when the rumor was told that there was a virgin who bore a son in Bethlehem, the city of David. Well, Tom, eight, sorry, eight, that is a very important point, and that is the reason why I mentioned this uh, uh, um, prophecy given to Daniel by Gabriel, because it was also the same archangel Gabriel that came to Mary, the mother of uh, Jesus in the flesh, to tell her that she will conceive from the Holy Spirit. And right. I think that is a very, very important point that is very often overlooked because people don't understand the 70th week being fulfilled by Jesus Christ. They don't see even the connection why Gabriel is the one that gives uh, the, uh, Daniel the prophecy and he is the same angel that prophesies to Mary that she will conceive without having known any man because mm -hmm. she is bearing a godly child. And mm -hmm. this is in my understanding the wonderfulness of of of, of the divinity of, of the whole quote unquote story that the same angel that gives the perfect understanding of Jesus Christ fulfilling the 70th week of this prophecy, giving this prophecy, that same angel is giving the promise to a woman that she will bear the child that will be God on earth, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Right. That's the that's why I made this point, Tom, that we that we can teach about the connection because I think there are many people who have never stood still by the fact that they read in the in Luke, I think it is chapter one, uh, when Mary gets the news from the archangel, that they don't even know that this same archangel already announced to uh, Daniel that Jesus would come at the end of the 70-week prophecy in the 70s in the last week as Messiah. Of course, he was born um, 27 year, uh, 30 years earlier because at the age of 30 he was anointed. That, that's another case. But I think it is so important that we uh, tell the people this... <laughs> I don't have words for this. You know, this is this is divine. Um, this is divine well, power. This is there's divine power it. sending there's, that angel. Right. Don't do it. There's more to it. While all of Israel was ignorant, except for uh, what was his name, Simeon. Yeah. Simeon was waiting at the steps of the temple on the eighth day of Christ's birth, on the eighth day of his life, waiting for him to come to be circumcised according to the law. And certainly, Mar Mary and Joseph brought. Uh, Jesus to the temple on the eighth day of his birth to be circumcised. And Simeon said, what did he say? Mine eyes have beheld the salvation of Israel. Well, how did Simeon know when the Bible says the Jews knew not the time of their visitation? Simeon knew. How did Simeon know? By the Holy Spirit. That's right, by the Holy Spirit. And how does the Holy Spirit work? Through the reading of the Word of God. And when you read the Word of God, all of it, you understand the prophecies that were made. And that's, that's right. what Simeon was not to. all the pastors and priesters in this generation read the Scriptures. They're supposed to be so excellent in the Scriptures. Say the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. Are they, are they truly filled with the Holy Spirit or are they full of something else? Okay. Here's something else. While all of Israel knew not the time of their visitation because their priest told them they weren't supposed to study the book of Daniel to ascertain, ascertain the timing of the coming of the Messiah, all of Israel knew not the time of their visitation. But what about those in Babylon? The Bible gives us example of the wise men who came from the east bearing gifts fit for a king. How is it that they knew Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem? Because Daniel saved their bacon about 483 years ago. Remember when, when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream? And he couldn't remember the details of the dream? And he asked for his wise men to be sent to him to not only tell him what the dream was, but also the interpretation and he gave them plenty of time 
and they couldn't do it. And the, and the wise men kept begging for time. Give us more time. The, the king asked us more than any king would ever ask his servants. And, Dan, and, and the king said, enough time. You're all a bunch of phonies. If you can't tell me the interpretation of the dream, nor can you tell me what it means, then I'm going to turn all your houses into a dung heap. In other words, he pronounced a death sentence against them. They were the sages, the wise men, and they were supposed to advise the king by, the, by, the, by reading the stars and by divination and by every kind of pagan magic, and they couldn't do it. And Daniel rescued them. He saved their bacon. He came to them and said, give me tonight. Me and my friends will pray, and I'll tell you not only what the dream was, but the interpretation of it. And so Daniel and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to prayer. The next day they went to the temple. They told the man exactly what he needed to hear. Told him exactly what the, what the dream was and exactly what the interpretation was. And all of those soothsayers, all those stargazers, all those diviners were saved. And you better believe for the rest of their relationship with Daniel, they were asking him questions. And what do you suppose Daniel was telling them? Daniel was obviously telling them the dream that he had or the message that he got from the Archangel Gabriel about the 70th week of Daniel. 483 years from the going forth of the command to restore uh, uh, the Jerusalem would be Messiah the Prince. And they remembered what Daniel told them. They remembered what Daniel prophesied. Now, all of Israel's ignorant. They're forbidden to read the book of Daniel, to read Daniel's prophecy. But even the magicians, even the soothsayers, even the diviners from the East, Nebuchadnezzar's crew knew when Messiah the prince would come, and they came bringing gifts fit for a king. So what would you say of the religious leaders of that day when the Scripture plainly tells us, speaking of the Jews, they knew not the time of their visitation? When even the soothsayers from, from Babylon knew and came with gifts to the city of David. And even Simeon, full of the Holy Ghost, could read Daniel's prophecy, could read a calendar, and was at the steps of the temple eight days after Christ's birth to, to, for, to feast his eyes upon the salvation of Israel. You see what injustice the religious leaders of that day did? Now, I'm telling you, as difficult as it is for many of us to comprehend, our religious, later, our religious leaders, I would almost said our religious leaders, because they're, they're a church-state union, see? They don't worship Christ, they worship the state. They told us, you shall not understand Daniel's prophecy. We're going to tell you a lie about Daniel's prophecy. We're going to tell you from cradle to grave, that Daniel's prophecy has never been fulfilled in the past. It's future, and it won't be fulfilled until just before Christ returns, which can be any time because we aren't given a clue when Jesus is going to return. The Jews, however, were given a red X on the calendar, 483 years from the going forth of this command until Messiah the Prince no such thing for his return. So they take the 70th week of Daniel, they cast it down to the end of time, and they can fulfill it whenever they get ready. Nobody can say you're late fulfilling the 70th week of Daniel. You know, they created the modern nation state of Israel in 1948 in order to fulfill this future phony 70th week of Daniel. 
And then in 1967, they fought the Six-Day War, and the Jews got control of Temple Mount. Boy, oh boy, now we can get busy building that temple so the Jews can make sacrifices and eat and drink damnation to themselves and reject Jesus Christ over and over and over every day. But somehow God keeps throwing a monkey wrench in it. The Muslims won't move their Dome of the Rock off the Temple Mount. There's all kinds of things that keep getting in the way of a building of a temple. You begin to wonder whether God really wants that temple to be built, don't you? You really got to wonder, don't you? How long has it been since 1948? I'm not doing, I'm not good doing math in my head. How about how many years have it been since 1967 when the Jews got control of Temple Mount? 53 years, Tom. Yeah, but, that's but a the, long time. That's a long time, almost 54 years. Uh, but, but the point is, I think God grants us this time for ministries like these to wake up people to the truth. Yeah, right. I think that's the only reason why he postpones um, the building of that temple. I couldn't yeah. think of any other reason. you you got to wonder why the God of heaven, uh, the God of redemption, the God of glory the God of the Jews and the God of the Gentiles just simply won't stop those uh, rockets from falling on Jerusalem. You know, he, he's, he's more accurate than our, than our, than our anti-missile batteries over there protecting uh, Jerusalem from the, from, the, from the scuds and from all the, the rocket attacks and terror attacks. You'd think God was just with his strong right arm. I mean, after all, God was not weak at all when he brought the Jews out of, 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 of Egyptian bondage, why wouldn't he just put a bubble over Jerusalem so the Jews can build that temple without worrying about a rocket going off in their pocket? Doesn't happen, does it? God wasn't so careless or imperfect in his delivery of the Jews from Pharaoh, was he? I mean, after all, 40 years they wandered in the desert and their shoes didn't even wear out. But they can't seem to get that temple built. They can't stop the rockets from falling out of the sky from any and every direction. They just can't get that temple built. Now everybody will tell you, oh, this is God's, this is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. This is the 70th week of Daniel. We just need to get this 70th week of Daniel going. We got to go to war against the Muslims and scare them to death so they don't shoot any more rockets. We got to get that temple built. We've got the priesthood ready to go. We've got all the golden vessels ready to go. We got the ashes of the red heifer to go. We've got to get that Dome of the Rock off of that Temple Mount. We've got to get the, the, the Palestinians out of there. But it just doesn't happen. Sixty years later, it doesn't happen. But you dare not suggest to anybody that's ever been to a church that God isn't behind this, that this isn't Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Because they've staked, they've written books about it. They've made movies about it. They've gotten filthy rich telling all these futurist lies. They've gotten all kinds of popularity. They've got their own church, mega churches. They've got their own jet airplanes. They've got their big hair and their Armani suits, and they're famous. They get to preach to pastors and kings and princes and potentates. They're celebrated up and down the street wherever they go. They got their own television programs, their own healing ministries. They're just famous people. But they never cease trying to explain why we still don't have a temple on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Well, I can tell you why. I can tell you why. The 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And what they're trying to do in Jerusalem right now is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, and God is not on their side. And while all of this nonsense is going on over in Jerusalem, you and me and anybody who's interested has got time to tell the truth about the 70th week of Daniel, and maybe God help us to wake up from this futurist delusion.
It's time for somebody to tell you the priesters and the pastors of our generation are just as guilty as the rabbis of Jesus' time. Jesus reviled the religious leaders of his time. Jesus reviled every one of them. He had nothing to say about any of them because it was them who sought to kill him. What would our priesters and pastors do today? Are you starting to get the, the hint? Are you starting to get the message? They've denied that Christ has come in the flesh. When they deny the historical fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel in Christ's ministry, they are literally denying that Jesus was the Messiah. And they're not going to repent. They've got their pride at stake. They've got decades of lies. They've got centuries of lies because this lie began to be told in England in the semin seminaries about 1805 to 1810. It went through the Tractarian movement. Oxford. John Nelson Darby. Cyrus Schofield. The Plymouth Brethren. They propagated that lie in the United States of America, and it was just spread like wildfire across this country. Now, there were spirit-filled, Bible-believing Christians that fought against this futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy from the very beginning. These are the books that 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 Yerk and I read on our programs. Those are books written by God-fearing, Bible-believing Protestants. What made them Protestant? Because they protested the Antichrist. That's why they were Protestant. They protested the papacy. That's what made them Protestant. They protested well, why would they protest the Pope, Tom? Because they knew the papacy was the Antichrist. They didn't believe in a future Antichrist. They'd never heard of this future fulfillment of Daniel and a, and a, a future Antichrist of, of making a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews. No. That was Jesus 2,000 years ago, made a, a, a covenant in his blood 2,000 years ago. And in the midst of the week, he made good on that covenant when he shed his own blood for us. What diabolical entity would tell God's people of a future 70th week of Daniel? Why, of course, the papacy, the real antichrist. The papacy, they're the author and the finisher, the alpha and omega of the futurist deception. It's all designed to protect the papacy from the onus of Antichrist. And who do you suppose, when they finally are allowed by God to continue to fruition to its finish, this future diabolical lie in Jerusalem? Who do you think is going to ride into Jerusalem after there's a seven-year peace treaty signed with some phony antichrist, and after three and a half years is broken by this so-called future antichrist, who do you think is going to ride into Jerusalem on the colt the fall of an ass? Class? Is it really that difficult? It's going to be the papacy. The one who has always said he is the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, has all the power of God on earth. Every man, woman, and child on the planet ought to bow and worship and obey him. Every king of the earth must worship and obey and rule the people as if the Pope was God on earth. It's too easy, you guys. 
This is not rocket science. It's really rather easy to comprehend. Once you finally get somebody to tell you the whole truth. But don't expect the whole truth to come from your so-called Protestant pastor, because he's not a Protestant anymore. He cannot possibly protest the Antichrist because he doesn't even know who it is. He thinks it's somebody that looks a little bit like Mitt Romney that's going to come about the year 2026 or 2030, somewhere in there, after they get the temple built on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem and begin animal sacrifices again. It's all speculation. And as a matter of fact, they are not even able to tell you when it's going to take place because the Bible says you shall not know the day or the hour of Christ's coming. And the more people I can make realize that that sticks. No one is going to know the day or the hour of Christ's return. Those who believe that and hold to that truth are the ones who are finally going to come to realize that this futurist de delusion is exactly that, a delusion. Because after this three and a half year period and the Antichrist breaks his agreement with the Jews and causes the animal sacrifices and oblations to cease. All the futurists are going to say, despite what the scripture says emphatically, they're going to say 1260 days from today, Jesus is going to return. And you know what I got to say to them? They know not the time of Christ's visitation. They're liars. They've, de they've been deceived, and they've deceived everyone else. And they're still deceiving. And they're not going to repent. That's the truth. Jesus said in the scripture, he said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? Uh, most likely not if they're looking for a future antichrist. Because they're going to get one and they're also going to get a future phony Christ. And they'll be worshiping him when Jesus comes. That's the whole purpose of futurism to get you to worship a false Christ, to get you to worship and obey a false Christ. And I say that false Christ is, was, and always will be the papacy, the one who thinks to change God's times and laws, the ones who thinks that he is the vicar or the replacement of the Son of God on earth, the one who has fulfilled every prophecy in the Bible regarding Antichrist, accepting none, and he will sit on a throne in Jerusalem proclaiming himself to be Christ on earth. And the whole world will worship and obey him. Why? Because they won't be able to buy or sell if they don't. No retirement benefits for you. No Social Security for you. Because you're a rebel. You're a threat to the divine state religion of the papacy. Satan's vicar on earth, the papacy. The one who exalts his throne above the stars of God, who sits upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, the one who says, I am like God, that's the papacy. It, it's always been the papacy. That's been the papacy's claim to fame for, what, 1,800 years. I am like the Most High. That's what it says in Roman Catholic canon law. That's what you must believe if you are a Roman Catholic, that the Pope 
is the replacement of God on earth. He has all the power and prerogative of God on earth. And only he and his priest can forgive your sins, but you got to confess them to him first. It's really not all that difficult, is it? Futurism is death to a believer. If you believe in a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, you are in dire jeopardy. You can't say Jesus is the Christ and then turn right around out of the other side of your mouth and say he's never come. You can't say you are washed in the blood of the Lamb of Almighty God. Your sins are washed away, cast as far as the east is from the west. And then turn around and say, let's help the Jews build a temple and begin animal sacrifices so they can eat and drink damnation themselves, just like the Roman Catholics do. You cannot say you are washed in the blood of the Lamb and then listen to your protestant priester behind the pulpit of your church tell you that the what used to be called communion is now called the Mass and that it's no longer a memorial of what Christ did for us 2,000 years ago, but it is an efficacious, propitiatory sacrifice, bloodless though it is, It is just like the Roman Catholic Mass. That's what they're going to be teaching you in these Protestant and Evangelical churches. They are nothing but Catholic churches in training. They're going to keep their name Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, you name it. They're going to keep their names, but they're really married to a new spouse called the papacy, the pope. They've divorced Christ. They said he didn't even come. Messiah has not yet come. When they say the 70th week of Daniel is future, they say Jesus was not the Messiah. He might have been a priest. He might have been a prophet. He might have been a, a, a priest, a prophet or a sage or just a good person, but he was not the Messiah. That's a little like uh, Pope John Paul II, who said, and I quote, Jesus did not come to be the Messiah. Jesus came to show us the Christ in every man. Pretty soon your priesters behind the Protestant pulpits of your churches are going to see going to agree with him. And they pretty well have to if they say the 70th week of Daniel is future, because that's the same as denying that Christ the Messiah ever came. I don't know how many ways I can say it. I don't know how many ways I can prove it, but the Bible does, and that's a greater authority than me and Yerk and everybody else trying to tell the truth. The script, it's just in plain black and white. In your authorized 1611 King James Version, start in the book of Matthew, read to the book of Revelation, and you will find that the 70th week of Daniel was performed perfectly and completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ, Messiah the Prince, 2,000 years ago. And anybody that talks about a future 70th week of Daniel is of the spirit of Antichrist. Oh, 
Exalt.